So as I said before, we are going to do the third order response function, and then we're going to stop, I promise. Although, it's tempting. So just remember, third order response is going to include anything like pump probe, uh, 2D spectroscopy, the way most people do it. Um, but actually, you'll see later, it's also a the way that we will treat uh, something like fluorescence. The only difference is that the two fields, the first two field interactions will be from us, from the laser, or the light source, whatever it is, and then one field interaction will be the spontaneous fluctuations of the electromagnetic vacuum and the signal is the fourth field that comes out. And so that's how fluorescence works in the context of perturbation theory. Okay, so we're going to do the same you know, procedure that we've done over and over again. So we write down S3. Now, of course, there's three times, right? And I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to cut the chase on this one as well, similar to how I did on the second order one, where we have our Gs. But if you like, if you like filling in the details, it's, it's, it's straightforward and it's kind of relaxing. You know, you have, you can think of it a little bit like, um, like if people like to do crossword puzzles or Sudoku or whatever. This is not that different. Just have to know a lot of quantum mechanics first. But you do. So it's no problem. Okay. And just remember the trick is you're gonna use these G's. The G shifts this, the G we're um, the G shifts these and we, we write them in the um, in the um, interaction picture and so then we put in the, the, the G's. With the G daggers, remember that trick. Okay, that's how this goes. And then we get a whole bunch of commutators in Hilbert space. All right, and it's going to look like this. We have outside our heavy side functions, the signal has to come after all of the things. Are they all the times have to be positive? Isn't the way of saying that? Um, and this. All right. So we have the commutator. So it's the pattern actually pretty reasonable. You can almost guess it just by looking up here once you've seen a couple of these. And that's the final uh, line. Now, similarly, just like the other ones, um, how many terms are there going to be? Well, we're going to have one, two, three, four of these things. So uh, there's going to be a total of eight terms. And just like in the other ones, each term has uh, each of each of four terms. So half the terms are actually the complex conjugates of the other four uh, of each of the other, of one of the other four. So each of the um, so the whole t the whole response function can be written down as a sum of a number of a, of a function and then its complex conjugate. There's a minus sign, of course, just like all the other ones had. So we did it first for the linear case, and then the pattern follows all the rest of them. Right? And so then what we have here is a sum, alpha equals 1 up to 3 now, uh, wrong, up to 4. All right? And then you just have this R term, R, we'll call it R alpha, uh, T3, T2, T1, minus R alpha star. All right, so then there are so there's four of these R terms, and if you want to get this one, you just take the complex conjugate of it. All right, so let's write down what those four terms are. I will fast forward through this because there's no need to see me write this out slowly. <laughs>
So there you have that. These are all of the different pathways that give rise to the third order response function. Okay, and it's written in the time domain, as you can see here. Now, one point that is worthwhile to, to think about um, is that in some of the actual experiments people do with these different um, with the response functions, there might be things that simplify. For example, as I mentioned before, this is a this is the response function that you would use for pump probe spectroscopy. All right, so pump probe is one of the oldest kinds of ultrafast spectroscopy. There's sort of examples of this that date back almost 100 years, uh, where you, you trigger something and then you look at it later with some kind of measurement device. Um, there's an example from, I think it was Kerr, but it could have been someone else, where they used a, an explo a little miniature sort of explosion and then a um, transient biorefringence to measure an extremely fast process, like in almost the 19th century. So. Um, the idea is not surprising. You, you trigger a process to start and then you look at it some amount of time later. Um, so this would look like in an experiment, if you had two laser beams, you typically cross one uh, with respect to the other in your sample. So here would be your sample here. And you'll have a pulse, you know, a, a, a piece of light that's on and off. And there'll be another pulse. One might be the pump and one's the probe. And there'll be a time delay between these two. Right, so in some sense, there's only there's one time delay. You have one pulse that acts as two field interactions twice. Okay, so what that means is that another way of saying this is that t1 is equal to zero. If t1 is the delay between the first and the second interactions in our in our experiment, right, and so t1 is equal to zero. This would be what you would normally call a delta t of the time delay. This becomes T2 for our nomenclature here. And then T3 is the signal that's generated following the, um, the third interaction, right? So um, those are what the three, those are the three times. And the idea, of course, is that the signal will be generated in the time domain, um, but most commonly it's generated, it's detected in the frequency domain. And so we're going to have to learn how to switch back and forth between these things. So T3, if I'm going to draw it like in sort of the way things fly through space, this one's going to fly the pump and the probe is here and the signal will be like some kind of electric field that's emitted and it would look kind of like it was in this direction. Of course, it's going to come after the sample, right? But it's big at early times and it gets later. It gets smaller as you go. And so the idea is this is T3. We would measure this in a spectrometer. So we would do the Fourier transform of this to get a spectrum, whatever that is, in the frequency domain. Now, we'll we can talk a little bit more about spectrometers. Spectrometers don't really measure um, with diffraction gratings anyway. They don't measure frequency. They measure wavelength. Um, but that's a sort of a technical detail that's interesting, especially if you do the experiments yourself, um, but not practically very useful, not really relevant from the theoretical point of view. All right, and so if you just have a single pump pulse or Usually that's the way you think about having a single pump pulse. It has it's like having two field interactions occurring simultaneously. So T1 equals zero. So that simplifies almost all of these formulas here, right? Because that means that a lot of pathways are indistinguishable because there's no separation of time delay between the first two interactions. Right? So we would think of them as occurring simultaneously. Um, so that's just one example of how you can uh, say, oh my gosh, how am I ever going to make sense out of these all these terms? Uh, the other thing that's helpful to realize is, of course, once you know R, you know, alpha, the different four R terms, you don't need to separately consider the, the complex conjugates. You just remember that your signal is going to be this difference between the two of them. All right, so, um, of course, the actual signal needs to know about the complex conjugate. But what you can do, of course, is we, we already proved that this is related to the imaginary part, so don't have to uh, keep doing that twice. So most of the information then that we need to consider about the different pathways is in here. And what I'm going to show you how to do next is I'm going to show you how to consider a diagrammatic way of representing these pathways. It's totally opaque here what's going on. I admit it. I don't, I don't, I don't see anything here. And I don't think I would expect anybody else to see anything here. But what we're going to do is we're going to remember that we have this density operator. And we can draw density operators like this. We can draw the, the bra and the cat. So we'll have the 
Marquette side of the density operator represented over here and the bra side over here. All right, so if you started in the ground state, you would, that would, we would represent that like GG, for example. And then we know that the field is going to interact at these different times, right? And here we can see um, what's happening. And so what we're going to do is we're going to associate with the different delays or the different time orderings different fields that have, for example, different fa uh, wave vectors or directions in the lab. And um, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how can we select different pathways by choosing the detection frequency. That's one thing that we can do. That's one option. And the second option is you can check the signal direction. It turns out if you use multiple fields with different um, angles relative to each other, then the different pathways will actually, many of them, will go in different physical directions in space. So you simply move your detector to the one that you want to measure. And that's actually been one of the most useful ways that people have been able to um, measure and understand nonlinear spectroscopy, even though it seems hopeless because there's so many terms and they seem like they're all overlapping. Um, a more modern way of doing this, instead of using different directions, is we actually have the ability to modulate the phases of these fields separately. And then by recording the signal that you're the same, doing the experiment multiple times, but with different relative phases between the fields, we can then add them together in an appropriate way to select out one of these different pathways or another. And in fact, that's how NMR does it. So the other term, the other way you can do it is by what's called phase cycling. So now in multidimensional spectroscopy, uh, where we use optical pulse shapers, we routinely use phase cycling to select the different pathways. Um, if we don't use a pulse shaper, then we have to rely on the different directions. But in the, either way, um, there are sort of pluses and minuses of each of those different approaches, and I'll, I'll probably be able to touch on a few of them. But the next thing that we want to do is simply figure out what could the different frequencies be right, when you have multiple fields interacting with the material. And then you'll find a use for all of those uh, trigonometric identities that you learned whenever it was that you learned them. Mm -hmm.